I've been looking at history and I've been impressed and depressed by the fact that history is really a chronicle of immense atrocities. What we have in history is the fact that when surplus value develops, when there's more than a subsistence economy, you have some portion of the population that will do everything it can to enslave and to expropriate the labor of the rest of the people. Whether it's a slave society, as in ancient Greece and Rome, or feudal society where people were reduced to serfs, or in a capitalist society where people are driven to the edge of insecurity and made to work faster and harder. And one of the things that's used in that arrangement is a, a very conscious instrument of control that's very necessary. And that instrument is called the state. That is, what they do is set up a state, an organization that has a, as Max Weber, who wasn't a Marxist, as Max Weber called it, an organization that has a monopoly on the legitimate uses of force and violence, on the use of legitimate force and violence. But that's what we have today. We also have developed in modern times uh, some democratic features, some means of trying to fight back and restrain this arbitrary power. What are we trying to say is that along with government, we also have a thing called the state. And, and along with governance, along with policies, and along with those things, we have this other instrument, even in a democratic state. And that instrument, whether it's in democratic France, or democratic England, or democratic Germany, or democratic Italy, or, all, or democratic USA, or democratic Canada, and all these countries, all of them have these other instruments and agencies that act like a bunch of gangsters, that act repressively, that use surveillance, that use every dirty trick in the book, unequal enforcement of tax laws, name it. The bringing in of drugs into whole neighborhoods and communities, trumped up murder charges, assassination. And that you have in the middle of these democracies, you have the state within the state known as the national security state. And that state is capable of the most unspeakable crimes that you can think of. And those crimes are perpetrated against their own people. They're perpetrated against people all around the world. Not long ago, I got a letter from a woman who's been a community organizer in Chicago. And she said with grief in her heart, she said, I remember the 60s. I remember the tremendous democratic organization and leadership that was developing in the Latino and African-American communities. And I remember those leaders and every single one of them today is either dead shot by the police or in Marion prison on trumped up charges. And I remember the demoralization that took place, the shattering of those organizations. And after those organizations were shattered and demoralized, then in came the drug traffickers. And those drug traffickers, the thing I remember the most about them is that they were aided and abetted by the feds, by the federal agents themselves. And this is what happens. That is, we are dealing with a state that was engaged in domestic counterinsurgency. And it was more interested in having a population that was unorganized and demoralized than a population that was organized, that was effectively fighting for its democratic rights. Because if it's organized and it's effective and it's powerful, it will start making demands and start pursuing its interests and it will start cutting in on the interests that those police and those coppers and those undercover people and those uh, forces of uh, military and, and law and order are dedicated to protecting, protecting the status quo, protecting those with property against who do not, those who don't have it. And by the way, all, for the last thousand years we've had theorists who've made that point, except they make it proudly. Adam Smith said, as the divisions of property become increasingly unequal, it is more and more necessary to have a state to defend those who have property from those who do not. John Locke, the purpose of the state is to defend those who have property from those who do not. James Harrington, uh, you can go on, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton. The only difference was that when Marx said it, he said, to defend those who have property from those whose labor is expropriated by those who accumulate wealth off their labor, who have all the property. He changed it a little bit. And he said it wasn't just haves and have-nots, it was haves taking it from those who produced it and created the haves. And throughout the world, 
dominant economic interests today have enlisted the efforts of assassins and torturers. As we talk at this moment, the CIA and other such agencies in this country and other countries have sponsored violence, torture, death squads, drugs in scores of countries, from Zaire to Angola to Mozambique to El Salvador to Guatemala to Indonesia to East Timor, and you go on and on and on, all through, to, to Western Europe, to the USA, to Chicago and Detroit and Boston and New York. They have systematically targeted, in many countries, the clergy, the peasant leaders, intellectuals, journalists, student leaders, labor union leaders, workers, and any community activists and such. Tens of thousands have been murdered and assassinated to prevent social change, to destroy any kind of redistributive politics, any kind of government, any kind of social movement that is not willing to reduce its people to economic fodder. And with NAFTA, with the North American Free Trade Agreement, we now see the third worldization of the USA will continue full speed ahead. The gangster nature of the state is cloaked by the democratic facade and by the democratic substance of the government. I mean, there is some democratic substance there. Democratic victories have been won. We have struggled and, and certain things have been won. And yet in the midst of this, this state still goes on. And what is so compelling about an issue like drugs, as Michael Levine is pointing out, is that it's not that we're saying the government is not doing enough about drugs or they were losing the war against drugs, is that the government or elements in it are active perpetrators and purveyors of drugs. And what it is so compelling about the JFK assassination is how nakedly the gangster nature of the state is revealed. It is an awakening. And to know the truth about the JFK assassination is to create a delegitimating force that calls into question the entire state system and the entire social order it represents. And this is why for 30 years, the mainstream press has suppressed or dismissed out of hand the findings about JFK's death. The findings of independent investigators like Peter Dale Scott, Harold Weisberg, Carl Oglesby, Mark Lane, Anthony Summers, Philip Melanson, Jim Garrison, Cyril Wecht, and dozens and dozens of others. They're called assassination buffs. They're not buffs. Even that word is a limiting and marginalizing and diminishing term. A buff is a kind of a hobby pursuer, you see. It's a kind of a, 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 a quirky person who follows quirky little interests. Would you talk about Holocaust buffs, would you? No. They are serious investigators of a very serious crime, which leads to all sorts of serious understandings about the criminal nature of the state. And this is why they relentlessly, the mainstream media and the opinion leaders and the, and the political leaders of this country, relentlessly attack or ignore this literature. And this is why they give fulsome, gushing, ready publicity to the likes of Gerald Posner with his book Case Closed, which got, got put into every major magazine. I couldn't put the TV on all week without seeing this guy's face and hearing him blather these kind of cliché uh, statements whose whose credibility are dependent on you being totally ignorant of, of what the investigators for 30 years have been uncovering and the questions that have been raising. And we did a grotesque, idiotic whitewash of the whole thing. And this is why they savaged, they savaged Oliver Stone's movie, JFK, a movie that was very accurate about the specifics of the murder, a movie that reached millions of people that broke through that thing that they were keeping down. The only movie in the history of Hollywood, and I wrote a book called Make Believe Media, which is about TV and films, so I think I know something about films. At least I, I did spend the better part of a year reading a lot of literature. It's the only movie that I know of that was attacked six months before it was ever released in the Washington Post and in the New York Times and in Time and Newsweek and attacked relentlessly for a year after it was released. And this is also why in this past week they kept up the relentless propaganda campaign with the 30th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination to show that Oswald was the lone assassin. And, and they're always limiting the question, just as the Warren Commission did a priori, did, was Oswald the lone assassin? Did he act alone? Did he or did he not act alone? Meanwhile, all...
or one of the people who shot Kennedy. He did not act at all, although he was involved in another way. He was involved as a fall guy. And this is why they do this. If you want to know why, you just listen to them. It's not my analysis, it's what they say. The propagandists of the right and the center know why they've got to trash this issue and contain it. Listen to what Tom Wicker of the New York Times had to say. Now, Tom Wicker, he's never written a movie review in his life. JFK came out and Tom Wicker, who was a columnist, a Washington columnist for the New York Times, suddenly became a movie reviewer. And instead of getting the usual movie review length of 800 words, he got 2,000 words. It's a whole page with pictures and all that. And in that review, he tells us that if the, quote, wild assertions in Oliver Stone's movie are taken at face value, Americans will have to accept the idea that most of the nation's major institutions conspired together and carried out Kennedy's murder. In an era, Wicker goes on, in an era when mistrust of government and loss of confidence in institutions, the press not the least, are widespread and virulent, such a suggestion seems a dubious public service. <laughs> so truth or not truth has nothing to do with it. He's saying the question is institutional legitimacy. Wicker understands the heart of the matter. A full revelation about the murder would be a serious attack upon the legitimacy of the dominant institutions of state and class. The press not being the least of one of those institutions, a faithful servant of it. The system that New York Times writers faithfully defend. Playing before mass audiences, the movie JFK did not finger a cabal of malevolent perpetrators, but in fact pointed the finger at the national security state itself as the murderer. Damage control. You know, back in 1978, the House Select Committee reported, in fact, after an investigation, that there was more than one assassin shooting Kennedy. And there, therefore, was a conspiracy. In response, the Washington Post immediately editorialized in 1978, quote, Could it have been some other malcontent whom Mr. Oswald met casually? <laughs> it gets better, it gets better with... Could not as many as three or four societal outcasts <laughs> with no ties to any one organization have developed in some spontaneous way a common determination to express their alienation in the killing of President Kennedy. It is possible that two persons acting independently attempted to shoot the president at the very same time. It is possible. It's not at all likely. <laughs> so sometimes those who deny conspiracies create the most convoluted fantasies of all. David Garrow, who wrote a biography of Martin Luther King, benignly, patronizingly looks at you, at the public mind. And he says that the evidence pointing to a conspiracy to murder Martin Luther King uh, no. At large, you see what it is, a large majority of the American people do believe in assassination conspiracies. That allows events to have large, mysterious causes instead of small, idiosyncratic ones. I would say the Washington Post had the most mysterious cause of all a few minutes ago. <laughs> they like that. They like the large causes. You see, but the question of conspiracy it has to be decided by an investigation of evidence, not by a priori, unscientific and patronizing presumptions about the public mind. In any case, the evidence in King's assassination doesn't involve large, mysterious causes, but very immediate actualities. And the investigators, like Peter Dale Scott and Harold Weisberger and Mark Lane, they weren't impelled by some yearnings, you see. They were impelled by questions of evidence by things that didn't just seem to make sense, by very immediate empirical things which drew them into this more and more. But which these people who never read that evidence don't have to deal with and so they can fashion all these theories.
The independent investigators demolished the Warren Commission. The, the first and most effective, perhaps, was Harold Weisberg's book, Whitewash, and, the other, and then the other one by uh, Mark Lane, Rush to Judgment. Right there, terrific, written uh, 25 years ago. Let's focus on a small part of the actual conspiracy. I can't obviously go through it all. It would take ages. Let's start with Oswald. If you watch television this week, you again, for the, for the 78th time, um, heard that Oswald was a loner and incompetent, not very bright. You heard he was emotionally disturbed. Gerald Posner got on there, turning instant psychiatrist, and he said, Yeah, Oswald was a very disturbed young boy. He had a very disturbed childhood, and he was a passive-aggressive. I said, a passive-aggressive? A passive-aggressive assassin? I was there. That explains why he used a rifle which couldn't shoot straight. <laughs> he also was a leftist. Alexander Coburn has joined the right and the center and, and in a column in the examiner said he was a leftist. The truth is something else. Lee Harvey Oswald, all his IQ tests show that he was above average intelligence. He was a bright guy, a quick learner. Oswald, Lee Harvey Oswald spent most of his adult life not as a lonely drifter, but directly linked to the U.S. intelligence community. At the age of 18 in the U.S. Marines, he had secret security clearance, and he was working at Marine Air Control in Atsugi Base in Japan. Atsugi was a top secret base where the CIA launched some of its U-2 flights and did other kinds of covert operations in China. The next year, at the age of 19, he was assigned to El Toro Air Station in California with security clearance to work radar. And here he emerged, certain strange things began to happen. He emerged as a babbling Russophile and Soviet communist. He started playing Russian language records at blast level in his barracks. He started addressing his fellow Marines in Russian. He read Russian books and touted Soviet communism as, quote, the best system in the world. He called his fellow Marines comrades. Now, the U.S. Marine Corps in 1958 was not exactly known as a bastion of liberal tolerance and free thinking. My buddy Bernard Livingston wrote a book called Closet Red. He tells of his experiences in the Army where they had to filter out anybody who had funny opinions, who had pinko-ish opinions or whatever else, they had to be reported. That the Army constantly, and I'm sure the Marines, constantly surveils anybody who might outspokenly or actively begin to say or act certainly in the way he did. But in this instance, Oswald's Marine commanders didn't mind. He kept his security clearance. He kept all the radar records. He could see what was going in and out and knew all about the things that were happening there. And he had a wealth of sensitive radar information and other inf highly inf uh, sensitive information from sensitive uh, bases, black operations as they were called. Well, if Oswald was a Soviet spy or a Cuban spy, as some people now claim, he certainly had a novel way of building a cover. Other odd things began happening. In February 1959, Lee Harvey Oswald failed the Marine Corps proficiency test in Russian. Six months later, he was practically fluent in Russian. Only in 1974, a document that was dislodged from the Warren Commission that had been secreted, thanks to Howard Weisberg's legal efforts, got the document out. It was shown that Oswald had attended the U.S. Army Monterey School of Languages. Now, Monterey is not open to anyone who just happens to have a hobby, a language hobby. You go only for serious training and you are sent by the government and it must be related to government work in a language picked by the government which is related to specific assignments. So Oswald learned Russian at the U.S. Monterey School of Languages. Another odd thing, Oswald was given an early discharge from the Marines because his mother had injured her foot. That's called a dis dependency discharge. Your parent needs you. A jar had fallen on her toe. And he was immediately, he put in the request and he got it within a week. His fellow Marines were astonished at the, uh, at the uh, velocity of the release. It also so happened that the jar fell on her foot a year before the discharge. <laughs> <laughs> 
but she was having, it wasn't healing right, you know. This was only one of a number of very strange calls began to give Lee Harvey Oswald. He then defected to the USSR. But how? Philip Melanson raises the question. To get to, to Russia in those days, it would have cost $1,500. Lee Harvey Oswald's bank account showed a deposit of only $203. He got, after he arrived in London and was there, he left London and went to Helsinki on October 11, on a day when there were no available commercial flights that would have allowed him to make it in one day. He had some kind of private transportation to get to Helsinki. In Russia, he announced that he was denounced, renouncing his U.S. citizenship and that he had lots of secrets that he was going to give to the Soviets. He even went into the U.S. Embassy and announced that and made sure they all knew it. <laughs> the Soviets didn't bite. They let him stay, but they at no time thought he could be an agent of any use to them. They kept him under constant surveillance. He worked in a factory. He showed no particular interest in guns, but he belonged to the factory's gun club. He used to join in the rabbit shoots, and he could never hit the rabbit. And always someone had to come behind him and shoot the rabbit while he was firing, otherwise they would have been there all day. It was a joke. He was a miserable marksman, as he had been in the U.S. Marines. He had been flagged again and again. On the, on the, he missed the whole target a number of times. You get the flag. So Lee Harvey Oswald's show was a, uh, couldn't hit the side of a barn. Now, if Lee Harvey Oswald was really a defector and not a U.S. spy, then U.S. intelligence could well have taken the view that his was one of the most damaging defections in history. Now, what's done in all defections especially those connected with, definitely those connected with government and military, is that there's a damage assessment. No damage assessment was ever made on Oswald's defection. This did come out in the Warren Commission and the House Select Committee. Why was, there was no damage assessment. I guess it was just overlooked. We don't know. After two and a half years, he applies to return to the U.S. This is after renouncing his citizenship, announcing he was going to give away secrets, and instead of being grabbed when he comes out and tried as a traitor, the U.S. accepts him back. And he says he was never debriefed. In fact, he was debriefed in Holland, in Amsterdam, but the CIA has no record of debriefing him. It doesn't, doesn't know who he is, never touched him, was never near him. And their explanation before the commission was that there were so many tourists coming in and out that there was nothing particularly about him that would, would, would catch our attention. One might wonder, what is needed to catch your attention? <laughs> a defector, a, a secrets, a, all that. <laughs> After the assassination, the CIA claimed that they suspected that he was a Soviet spy. They still didn't debrief him, debrief him then. That makes it even more curious. He gets, he gets out of Russia, and what does the State Department do? They give him money. They give him money to travel back to the U.S. and get set up. They pay all his travel and moving expenses and those of his wife's. He's given back his passport with full rights to travel anywhere and denounce the U.S. government again someplace else. His wife is exempted from usual immigration quotas. No waiting. No exclusion for having belonged to the Soviet Komsomol, which is the Communist Youth Organization which is a violation of U.S. immigration laws, yet she was allowed in. Once back in Dallas, Lee Harvey Oswald settles in under the wing of one George de Morenschild, a right-wing Russian with CIA ties. And this begins a whole pattern that goes on in Dallas and New Orleans, namely the forays out into the public eye as a leftist again. Once back in Dallas, Lee Harvey Oswald settles in under the wing of one George de Morenschild, a right-wing Russian with CIA ties. And this begins a whole pattern that goes on in Dallas and New Orleans, namely the forays out into the public eye as a leftist. He, uh, he starts a one-person fair play for Cuba organization in New Orleans, never has another member, never recruits another member. And all his time in New Orleans and in Dallas, he never once contacts a single member of the Communist Party or any other left organization although he writes lots of letters to the Communist Party USA and to the Socialist Workers Party, two groups which at that time weren't even talking to each other. Say, Dear comrades, how are you? We fight forward and we go on. Yes, what should I do? And this and that. Uh, send me instructions, you know. <laughs> he blazes a trail, local TV, fistfights, inflammatory incidents, leaflets, 
One of the leaflets shows he, that his organization was on Camp Street in the very same building that Guy Bannister had his office. Guy Bannister was an FBI agent and a whole bunch of other Cuban emigre right-wing groups were there. And his personal relations were with right-wing anti-communist Cubans or with right-wing um, crypto-fascists or CIA types or others. So while he supposedly was this leftist, and if you ever heard any of the tapes of him speaking and explaining what communism was or socialism was, it's laughable. It's this little rote, superficial thing. While he was a leftist, in fact, all his personal associations were with right-wing uh, people linked to the intelligence community. He also knew Jack Ruby. Now, they would have us believe that this man who couldn't hit the side of the barn took a Manlinka Carcana rifle whose sights were not even set an Italian weapon, by the way, which the Italians said, the, the weapon that never killed anyone on purpose. <clears throat> and he fired and killed the President of the United States. That he would forego shooting President Kennedy when he had a full body shot of him coming right at him down Houston Street, right toward the, right toward the, um, uh, the Texas Book Depository, where he could where he could go at him, go at him like a shooting gallery that's coming closer and closer. Perfect, the ideal thing. He didn't shoot him then. He waited until the car turned at a 110 degree angle down Elm Street, and as he went by and had only his head and a little portion of his shoulders, and then firing through the trees, he rapidly got off three shots in a few seconds. Something which the best marksmen in the country were not able to emulate until after much practice and after the sights on the Manlinka Carcana were reset and brought into a laboratory and fixed in there and they had all sorts of remarks to make about the awful performance of this rifle. By the way, right through a tree that was later cut down. We, we are asked to believe that a bullet would go through John Kennedy, pose in midair for two seconds, change directions and wound uh, Governor Connolly in two places and then reappear intact on a stretcher fallen out of Connolly's body. By the way, that's not true. It did not ever reappear on the stretcher as if fallen out of somebody's body. It had reappeared wedged into the side of the stretcher. It obviously had been pushed in there. So this was a bullet that jumped out of Connolly's body and wedged itself in the side of the stretcher. This magic bu bullet had a lot of magic in it. We're asked to believe that a treasure of physical evidence, the interior of the limousine, the presidential limousine itself, which would have all sorts of evidence, bits of shrapnel, whatever else, from bullet parts, blood, lines of uh, fire, which was, in, which was just accidentally taken, instantly torn out, destroyed, and totally rebuilt. That this was not a deliberate cover-up. But we're asked to believe that Kennedy's brain just disappeared. That the x-ray, which now shows a reconstructed head with no exit wound, is oddly taken with no lower, with no jaw. So it could be anybody's. You can't do any kind of dental identification to see if that x-ray is President Kennedy's. That the autopsy was just botched innocently. We're asked to believe that Jack Ruby, a gambler and gangster with links to the Cuban exiles and an acquaintance of Oswald's who once worked for Congressman Richard Nixon for the House and American Activities Committee in Chicago when his name was still Jack Rubenstein before he changed it to Ruby were asked to believe that he just took it upon himself to kill Oswald because he was so moved by the suffering that, had, that Oswald had caused the Kennedy family. Although Ruby, in his, a year later in jail, uh, repeatedly kept alluding to the fact that you don't know the whole story, there's much more behind all of this, uh, there's something really deep and sinister here and all this, and he was just simply dismissed by a media that was taking its cues. We're asked that the 21 witnesses, persons otherwise related to the case in some close way, with some information, privy to some conversations, whatever else, all who have met violent deaths were part of a colossal co coincidence, like the one the Washington Post was talking about. That later on in 1978, the second round of killings that started after the House Select Committee investigation, 16 more who died violently, they just happened to die coincidentally, violent deaths, including one of them being George de Morenschild himself, killed by a gun blast to the head three hours after a House Assassinations Committee investigator had tried to contact him. He was being set up for an interview. He was being set up for a lot more than that. George Morenschild was not only close to Oswald, 
but in his telephone book there was found a, an inscription or a, 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 an insert to uh, uh, George Pappy Bush, that he was a close friend of George Bush and there was a correspondence between them. The sheriff's office in Palm County, Florida found that his shooting was very strange and it was ruled a suicide. William Sullivan, a third FBI, third, third guy in the FBI who was supposed to appear before the House Committee to talk. By the way, Sullivan was on CIA, uh, according to Robert Murrow, he was on the CIA payroll. He was shot right outside his home by a man who claimed to have mistaken him for a deer. He was, <laughs> he was charged with misdemeanor and released in custody of his father, a state policeman. Sam Giancano, who died from natural causes when his heart stopped beating after a bullet went through it. One day before he was to testify about mob and CIA connections while, and while under government protection. And by the way, what comes out of this whole thing is the incredible linkages between the CIA and mob families and mob figures again and again. Because after all, the mob is very functional. They can do the kind of dirty things that, uh, that the CIA may sometimes want them to do. There are even some on the left, like Noam Chomsky and Alexander Coburn, who argue that this whole interest in the assassination comes from a Kennedy revival, a Camelot yearning, the yearning for lost Messiah. I'm giving quotes. These are quotes right from Chomsky. <clears throat> Coburn and Chomsky and others, they challenge the notion that Kennedy was assassinated for, for intending to withdraw from Vietnam or undo the CIA or end the Cold War. These things could not have led to his downfall because they were not true. Kennedy was a Cold Warrior, a counterinsurgent who wanted a, a military withdrawal from Vietnam only with victory. I have argued similarly in my book, Democracy for the Few, that in fact, indeed, Kennedy was a Cold Warrior and a counterinsurgent and that he should not be romanticized as a progressive. Chomsky, Coburn, and others claim that the change of administration that came with JFK's assassination had no large-scale effect on policy, not even on tactics. In other words, if Kennedy had lived, he likely would have fabricated a Tonkin Gulf Casas Belli. He would have introduced ground troops in a massive land war, as Lyndon Johnson did. He would have engaged in the merciless B-52 carpet bombings of Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, as Richard Nixon did. He would have risked destroying his own electoral base, proving himself a mass murderer as bad as Nixon. Chomsky and Coburn don't tell us how they know that. All we know is the one surviving Kennedy, the Robert Kennedy, in fact, went a different way. He became an anti-war critic. He opposed the war, he broke with the Johnson administration, and he said that his brother's administration, his administration, had committed terrible mistakes. The evidence we do have, in fact, is that John Kennedy observed Cambodian neutrality and negotiated a ceasefire and coalition government in Laos, which the CIA refused to honor. They preferred to back a right-wing faction that continued the war. Chomsky says much about troop withdrawal. He just wrote a whole book on this, Camelot Revisited and all that. But he says very little about troop escalation, other than to offer Roger Hilsman's speculation that Kennedy might well have introduced U.S. troops, ground troops, in South Vietnam. Maybe so, maybe not. In fact, the same Hilsman noted in the New York Times not long ago, and Chomsky doesn't note it, that in 1963, Kennedy was the only person in his administration who opposed the introduction of U.S. ground troops. He was the only thing preventing an escalation of the war. Forget the question of withdrawal or not withdrawal. He was a barrier in that sense. Whether or not there are certain left analysts who think Kennedy was or wasn't a progressive or a liberal and thinks that the CIA had no reason to kill him or other people had no reason to be dissatisfied with him, the fact is, do they see it that way? You know, entrenched interests are notorious for not seeing the world the same way that left analysts do. In 1963, people in right-wing circles, including elements in various intelligence organizations, did not believe that Kennedy could be trusted with the nation's future. Now, some months ago on a San Francisco talk show, I heard a guy come on, uh, it was on KGO, and he said, I've never said this before, I never said it, it's the first time I'm saying it, but I worked for Army Intelligence, and uh, in 1963 I was in Japan, and when he, and the accepted word around then was that Kennedy would be killed because he was messing too much with the intelligence community. And when word came of his death, um, we, we were, all I could hear were delighted comments like, we got the bastard. What JFK's enemies saw something, was, what they saw was something different from what Chomsky and Coburn have seen. 
They fixed on Kennedy's refusal to provide air coverage to the Bay of Pigs, his refusal to go in with U.S. forces, his unwillingness to launch another invasion of Cuba, his no invasion guarantee to, to Khrushchev on Cuba, his atmospheric test ban treaty with Moscow, his American University speech calling for a re-examination of our Cold War attitudes toward the Soviet Union, his unwillingness to send ground forces in, in, in a massive form into Vietnam, his antitrust suit against General Electric, his fight with U.S. Steel over price increases, his challenge to the Federal Reserve Board, his warm reception at labor conventions, his call for racial equality and responsiveness to civil rights leaders, reluctant responsiveness, his talk of moving forward in a new frontier. Erwin Noll, the progressive, says that he admits he has no idea who killed Kennedy. But this doesn't keep him from asserting that the Oliver Stone film was manipulative and that Stone provided false answers. How do you know that, Erwin, if you have no idea who killed Kennedy? And the remarkable thing about Erwin Knoll and Noam Chomsky and Alexander Coburn is they don't know a damn thing about the criticisms and investigation that's been made. We've said this again and again. In the rebuttals and the exchange in the nation, every, almost every one of them said, Alexander Coburn doesn't know anything about this case. He doesn't know anything about Lee Harvey Oswald, really. He doesn't know all, just some of the questions I brought up. They don't know anything. And they never deny it. They never say anything. They go on with their, with their patronizing comments. Well, Chomsky, patronization and condescension. Coburn with vitriol and venom. They go on attacking those who supposedly are idealizing Kennedy. Erwin Knoll shows he's flexible, though. He says he allows that the Warren Commission did a hasty, slipshod job of investigation. I disagree. The Commission did a brilliant job of investigation. It sat for 51 long sessions over a period of several months, much longer than most major investigations. It compiled 26 volumes of testimony and evidence. It had the investigative resources of the FBI and CIA at its command. Far from being hasty and slipshod, it painstakingly crafted theories that moved toward its foreordained conclusion that Oswald was the assassin. It framed an argument and moved unfailingly to fulfill that argument. It failed to call witnesses who saw something different from what it wanted to hear, who saw, who not only heard, but who saw people on the grassy knoll shooting. It failed to call them. It ignored or reinterpreted what little conflicting testimony that did creep into its proceedings. All this took deliberate effort. It was carefully crafted, painstakingly, a hasty, slipshod investigation would show traces of randomness in its errors. Some would go this way, some would go that way. But the Commission's distortions consistently move in the same direction in pursuit of a prefigured hypothesis. The gullible U.S. public that Erwin Knoll talks about. Knoll condemns Oliver Stone for playing on the gullibility of the American people. See, he's not gullible. He's cool. He doesn't fall for this. He's so cool he didn't even go see the movie. You see, the U.S. public has not bought the official explanation. 78% say they believe there was a conspiracy. And both Chomsky and Coburn, Coburn in The Nation, Chomsky in Z Magazine, and again in a letter in exchange with me, both of them dismiss that fact and point out the same identical analog. They point out that, in fact, over 70% of the people also believe in miracles. So, what does that prove? And what does that got to do with the question at hand? That people can have a stupid opinion about one thing doesn't mean they're stupid about everything. In fact, Chomsky and Coburn are themselves evidence of that. In any case, the comparison is between two different things. They're comparing the public's gullibility about miracles with the public's unwillingness to be gullible about the official line of it being fed and shoved in their faces for 30 years. That takes, that's not gullibility at all. <laughs> Alexander Coburn and Noam Chomsky have told us that we must not reduce great developments in history to conspiracy. For then we lose sight of institution, class, and other systemic factors of American capitalism. I don't need them to tell me about systemic factors in American capitalism. I use a structural analysis in all my writings. But investigating the JFK conspiracy, we are not looking for an escape from something unpleasant and difficult. That's psychiatrist Noam Chomsky speaking. But we're hitting upon the nature of state power in what is supposedly to be a democracy.
Conspiracy is not something that's in contradistinction to structural analysis. It is part of it. These guys will use conspiracy. They will use legitimacy. They will finance elections. They will use publicity campaigns. They will set up uh, liberalist organizations. They will set up alternative trade union movements. They will use assassins and death squads. They will use every single conceivable thing there is. And this was one of the things they used. When they had someone who was giving them trouble, when they had someone who was standing in their path because he was a little too bright and too shiny, when they had an agenda to save Southeast Asia from communism, they would kill one of their own. And that is a tremendous revelation. It was a startling revelation to the American public to make them realize what kind of a gangster government and national security state we really have in this country and what it does around the world. A structuralist position should not discount the role of human agency in history. Institutions are not self-generating forces. The great continuities of corporate and class interests, that's Coburn's phrase, do not happen of their own accord like reified, disembodied social forces. Neither empires nor national security institutions come into existence in a fit of absent-mindedness. Although the British elites used to say that, the British Empire was accumulated in a fit of absent-mindedness. Give me a break, give me a break, as these guys plotted and killed and brought armies in and destroyed and bribed and murdered and lied and did all the things and, and plundered these countries and plundered and plundered them. Absent-minded? God knows when you focus your attention what you would do. There's a conscious interest being pursued here, and the evidence for it is the state itself. These things, these events are created by willfully intended policymakers who pursue specific interests. It is the essence of the state and the function of state institutions to act as conscious agents in recreating the conditions of political economic hegemony. That's what it's there for. That's what they're paid to do. To achieve their goals, state leaders, especially those within the national security state, will resort to every necessary form of mass manipulation, deception, and violence, even against one of their own, whom they have come to see as a liability. Conspiratorial action is not, brothers and sisters, is not something separate and exclusive of institutional presence. In fact, there's a constant interplay between the two. And by the way, this is all this call for constructual analysis, institutional analysis. Where's the institutional analysis in the nation? All you get, all you get are, are conspiracies, uh, inside intrigues, uh, events, happenings, uh, uh, articles that preoccupy with immediate policies, issues, events, personalities, secret deals, all that kind of stuff. All of them of vastly lesser magnitude than JFK assassination. And yet, and yet in 30 years, the nation and the progressive have never published a single word by investigators like Peter Dale Scott and such, except a letter to the editor once in a while. Now, let me quote from Peter's, Peter's uh, uh, book, uh, deep politics. He raises this question of conspiracy and he points out that G. William Domhoff makes a point very much like Coburn's. He says, and Peter I think makes a point very much like the one I made, in, which I was quoting from, which was in my exchange with Chomsky and Z Magazine, about, and also with, with, with um, I mean, with Chomsky and, and also in The Nation, in my exchange with Coburn, I made this point that conspiracy and institution are not mutually exclusive. And they never have answered or addressed that point, either to rebut it or to accept it or to see how it doesn't apply here or does apply, whatever. They just ignore it. Damhoff points out, if conspiracy means that these men, meaning the ruling elites, are aware of their interests, know each other personally, meet together privately and off the record and try to hammer out a consensus on how to anticipate and react to events and issues, then there is some conspiring that goes on in the Council for Foreign Relations, not Economic Development, the Business Council, the National Security Council, and the Central Intelligence Agencies. But then Domhoff, Scott goes on to show that Domhoff shares that same kind of resistance that Coburn and Chomsky have to the idea that an assassination conspiracy could have a lasting impact on our political arrangements. We all have a tremendous tendency to want to get caught up in believing that there's some secret evil cause for all of the obvious ills of the world. Conspiracy theories encourage a belief that if we get rid of a few bad people, everything will be well in the world. He's quoting Domhoff. Then Peter answers, 
I believe that a true understanding of the Kennedy assassination will lead not to a few bad people, but to the institutional and parapolitical arrangements which constitute the way we are systematically governed. The conspiracies I see as operative, in other words, are part of our political structure, not exceptions to it. That's Peter Dale Scott. What the left critics do is that they mistake in the low political value of the victim, JFK, whom they hate and detest, their, their big fear is that you're going to like him, with the high po political importance of the issue and the implications for democracy, the revelation of the gangster nature of the state. I mean, Captain Alfred Dreyfus, back in 1894, was a conservative militarist. Clemenceau once conjectured that if his name had not been Dreyfus, he would have been an anti-Dreyfusade. Does that mean that the political struggle waged in L'Affaire Dreyfus was a waste of time? The issue was quickly drawn between the right and the left, between those who stood with the army and those who stood with the republic itself and with justice. The same with Benigno Aquino. Aquino was a member of the privileged class in the Philippines. He promised no great structural changes. He was even more conservative than Kennedy. Does this mean that the Filipino people should have dismissed the conspiracy that led to his assassination? As an event of no experience? So oh, just another ruling class pig, what do we care? <laughs> Instead, they used it as ammunition against the hated Marcos regime, as a revelation of what that government was really doing. Archbishop Romero of El Salvador, he was a member of the Salvadoran aristocracy. He could not have made it to the top of the church hierarchy otherwise. When he was ordained, they came with presents. They hugged and kissed him. And the minute he opened up his mouth and made some critical remarks and, uh, about the war and some favorable remarks about the poor, he was assassinated. I doubt if he hadn't been assassinated, the Salvadoran history would have been much different. Does this mean that solidarity groups in this country and in El Salvador should not have tried to make his murder an issue that revealed the homicidal gangster nature of the Salvadoran state? Instead of seizing the opportunity, some left writers condescendingly ascribe a host of mass psychology motivations and emotional needs to those of us who are concerned about the JFK assassination. They psychologize about our illusions, our false dreams, our longings for messiahs and father figures, our inability to face unpleasant realities the way they can. They deliver patronizing admonitions about our conspiracy captivation and Camelot yearnings. They urge us not to escape into fantasy. They are the cognoscenti who guide us and outleft us on the JFK assassination, a subject about which they don't know a goddamn thing and whose significance they will never be able and have not been able to grasp. I have a different name for our interests. It is not JFK worship. It's not Camelot yearnings, as the left critics would say. It's not big evils and conspiracy titillation, as the mainstream media would say. Our interest is born of democratic struggle, a desire to know what is going on, a desire to have rulers who are worthy of our name and the name of democracy. Thank you.